Now a look at tonight's top stories. The armed gunman who held several people hostage inside the U.S. bank in Bernie yesterday has died after being shot by authorities. His name has not been released yet, but authorities say the suspect fired at least 30 shots before officers shot him. He also wounded two bank customers. Investigators say they don't think robbing the bank was his main objective. They say he insisted that the silent alarm be pulled. Meantime, Chico Police Department has been asked to assist the Reading Police Department in its investigation. Police in Red Bluff are searching for two suspects in a shooting that sent one man to the hospital. Police say Joseph Kadat and Jason Pope were involved with the shooting on Madison Street yesterday. Two others are already in custody. The victim was shot in the thigh, listed in stable condition. A motive for the shooting has not been released. A big turnout today as local restaurants and the local community come together to help raise money for workers who temporarily lost their jobs when restaurants Tres Hombres and Mr. Pickles burned down two weeks ago in downtown Chico. More than a dozen restaurants are donating 10 percent of today's sales to help the 80 employees displaced by the fire. The benefit involves a group of independently owned restaurants and it continues tonight so there is still time for you to take part. For a list of participants, call the number on your screen. Short of a successful appeal, a water bottling plant is coming to Orland. This morning, the city's technical advisory committee approved Crystal Geyser's plans to build a plant on County Road 200 after it determined that the project did not need an environmental impact report as the land is already zoned for projects like this. Opponents argued that Crystal Geyser would use up too much of the area's aquifer. They also said that the plant would not bring enough jobs to make the plant worth it. Opponents have 10 days to appeal to the Orland City Council, which will likely take up the matter at its January 19th meeting. The future of the Orville Inn remains murky even after the City Council discussed the historic building at last night's meeting. The inn's owner is facing a multitude of violations because of alleged substandard living conditions for the families currently living there. Adding to the uncertainty is the long-range plans for the building, which is in desperate need of a private developer. The living conditions inside the Orville Inn are substandard for the 30 low-income families who live here. So says the city of Orville, which is forcing the building's owner, Jonathan Benefield, to fix some 600 code violations. If the ventilation, electrical, and other repairs aren't tended to by next month, the city will do it at the owner's expense. One tenant I spoke with says living conditions have improved. What are the conditions like there? They're really good. They're getting better every day. Getting better. How so? Just everything, a lot of repairs are being done, and a lot of things are being done for the people in the building. But there are still problems. Um, it needs a little bit of paint, I would think, and um, some of the appliances need to be fixed, I think. The building and the half an acre of land at Resson is for sale for $1.9 million. Given the recession, would anyone pay that price? Orville Vice Mayor Jamie Johansson is skeptical. Probably. The sense that it's still on the market at 1.9 is probably overpriced. The city is hoping to partner with the private developer, help buy the property, and make the Orville Inn an asset to the city. It isn't living up to its expectation as far as the highest and best use. Really, the goal would be a mix of um, residential and commercial uh, uh, stores downtown below people living above it. Trouble is, a market survey revealed at Tuesday night's council meeting shows that vacancies for residential and commercial use are way up as empty buildings already mar downtown Orville. The city hopes a viable private developer will make an offer, an offer that would come with city enticements like guaranteed loans. But even that may not be so easy in this economic environment. Construction loans are almost non-existent uh, in the banking industry right now. Meanwhile, residents here wait and wonder if and when anything will change. Action News spoke over the phone with the owner about an hour ago, Mr. Benefield, the owner told me that he is appalled with the city of Oroville, saying most of the violations in question have been, quote, fabricated in order to label his building substandard. He adds it is in retaliation to several lawsuits he filed against the city claiming civil rights and due process violations against him. A low-income housing project in Chico's Merriam Park will move forward. Construction on the 90-unit Parkside Terrace Complex is expected to start in April. After the Chico City Council okayed an additional $3 million in funding. The council had previously approved $7 million for the project on Hartford Drive, hoping to get the remaining $18 million from the state. The project didn't get those state funds, so the city agreed to pitch in the extra money after the developer agreed to cut construction costs and take out a loan to cover 
cover the remaining costs. An Action News update now. The city of Red Bluff has extended its ban on medical marijuana collectives. The city council voted unanimously last night to extend the ban on collectives, dispensaries, and co-ops through October. The vote followed a November 3rd decision to adopt a 45-day emergency ban. The emergency ban gave city staff time to rewrite the new amendments, which include new definitions of collectives. The council was also considering a ban on cultivation in the city, but has not voted on that ordinance. It's not a happy picture. The Senate today is stumbling toward a vote on health care reform. But there's disappointment on both sides, and a new poll finds that negativity is now shared by the American public. Steve Handelsman has the latest. Kelly, thanks. Good evening. On the defensive here on Capitol Hill and down at the White House, senior Democrats today insisted there's more to love than to hate in their health care reform bill. But they're fighting naysayers in both parties. The Senate debate on health care was stalled on purpose this afternoon. One Republican required an amendment to be read out loud. Section 1102, definitions relating to services. Almost three hours wasted. On the same day, the Centers for Disease Control reported that almost 60 million Americans went without medical coverage at some point since January 08. It's a crisis, Republicans admit, but they say Obamacare is not the answer. The core of the bill, at the heart of the matter, is the half a trillion dollars cuts in Medicare, the $400 billion in uh, tax increases. That message is winning more converts as debate drags on. 51% of Americans oppose the Democrats' plan in today's Washington Post ABC poll. 53% now believe care would cost more under the plan. And only 37% believe the quality of care would be better. We continue making progress toward making it possible for every American to afford to live a healthy life. Democratic leaders claim they're upbeat, right, but um, the compromises they've made to get independent <laughs> Joe Lieberman and moderate Democrat Ben Nelson on board, dropping the public option, blocking abortion funding, infuriates liberals like Howard Dean. It's just a giveaway to the insurance companies, and it's a takeaway from the American people. Illinois liberal Democratic Senator Roland Burris claims he will vote no. Democrats and the nation more divided than ever now on health care. But the Senate vote could come soon, the moment Democratic leaders think they've got the 60 senators they need to win. From Capitol Hill, I'm Steve Handelsman, NBC24 Action News. Jerry and Kelly, back to you.